So we've taken a look at nunchucks, but what about other flail type weapons? After all, nunchucks aren't the only flails. So of course, in my last couple of videos that I've done on this, I've looked at nunchucks, I've looked at them in quite a lot of depth, I've put them through some practical applications against my friend here. Uh, but of course, nunchucks are not the only flail weapon to have ever potentially existed and to have had doubts cast about their abilities. Now, like I've said before, just to make this absolutely perfectly clear, I don't believe that these are practical weapons by a long shot. They do have some use, yes, but they are more than likely just a close quarter weapon at best, but for the rest of the time they're just a training tool for developing hand and eye coordination. That said, as with just about anything you can imagine regarding both ancient Asia and ancient Europe, there are other weapons that have certain similarities with each other, different elements of culture and whatnot. I believe the term is parallel development or parallel evolution. It just depends on what parallels you can find in the different cultures and weapons and armour and so on and so forth. Knights and samurai? Yeah, they've got a certain similarity to them. Nunchucks? Well, we have in Europe the medieval flail, which may or may not have been genuine, but whether it was or wasn't, there's some debate about whether it would be useful or not. Now, I don't have a flail of any sort, but I can improvise one. In fact, I already have. So first and foremost, my first attempt to replicate it was to take these resistance bands, make balls either end of them, which obviously is not how a real morning store would have been, or rather flail would have been. You did get different variations of them, some of which have sometimes been referred to as a morning store, simply because they had a big ball with spikes on it like a morning store would. But a morning store was essentially a mace, a piece of wood with a big metal head at the end so that you could hit things with that end. You could still use the rest of the shaft to do damage in other ways, but it was principally the actual metal head at the end that would be doing all the damage. So my first attempt at replicating the idea was to just wrap this up into a ball here. Now of course you're probably thinking that wouldn't work and you'd be right because when I tried it out it just kept bouncing back quite quickly which might actually be a true indication of what would happen with a real flail as well. Because let's face it, yeah, it's bouncing back and it's a bit uncontrollable and because it's hitting my arm. And whichever way we do it, I'm always hitting my arm in some way or another. Now, the thing we've seen with examples of uh, medieval fails is that the length of the rope or the chain could be variable. Sometimes it would be relatively short, sometimes it would be relatively long. Of course, the thing with a longer one is it's still got the same sort of problem Although in some cases you can sort of uh, adapt and work around it. Sometimes it just ends up hitting the shaft, which of course has been simulated by the rest of the length of uh, plastic material here. But sometimes you miss, and sometimes it just hits you. Of course you'd have to be adapting sort of nunchuck principles of spinning around all the time. But of course this doesn't feel like a true depiction because of course there's no rod here and I do get the feeling that it's bouncing off a lot more simply because of the construction, it's rubber. Rubber has an ability to bounce to a certain degree especially when it's hitting something with force like that. So I went back to the drawing board. I grabbed a tennis ball and a length of string. Actually I grabbed two tennis balls and just tied them to the same length of string. Um, I just basically adapted everything along this sort of line. So again same sort of thing Maybe you should put it on to the other hand, but hey-ho. The thing about tennis balls is, of course, they are also bouncy. Okay. But I am having somewhat more success. Let's just try and get leg forward. I'm a habitual 
right foot back kind of person. So I'm having similar kind of issues to what I had with the nunchucks. It's, if anything, it's a bit more difficult to control because obviously it's a tennis ball, it's bouncing more. And of course you want tennis balls to bounce because if it was just a solid piece of uh, material like a credit ball, for example, it would probably do quite a bit of damage to the tennis players if it was to hit them or if it was to hit the, gr uh, the grass and so on and so forth, it would probably end up churning up the grass. So you want some bounce. And of course that makes it a little easier for the tennis players to uh, to pat the thing. So let's just see what I can do here. Yeah, I'm actually missing more than I'm hitting. I had much more success with the nunchucks. Haha, <laughs> yeah, and that just hit quite solidly above my elbow here. So, yeah, but of course, tennis balls. I don't really have anything me metal and round to simulate anything like that, but I do have this kind of expired soup. How expired? Well, bear in mind, it's uh, April 2021 as I'm doing this. This went off in March 2015. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really raided the pantry there. It's amazing what you can find. But just to give an idea, you know, this isn't particularly heavy. I mean, let's face it, is there anything to indicate the weight? Uh, probably not. No. But I can weigh it, because I've got scales just off camera here. This is a 16 ounce can of vegetable soup. Probably aluminium, I think. I think. It doesn't really say on the destructions what it is or isn't. But from tapping it here, yeah, that feels and sounds a bit more like aluminium. If it was steel, I think it would be a bit stronger. But basically, just hitting it lightly. Okay, I'm not putting much force into that, but the amount of force I can actually end up transferring through just with a light strike like that. You know. If there's enough force going through here into the floor, making the tripod wobble. Okay? So that's just with the light strikes here. If this was tied up to something, I might get a truer result of what a flail would be like. I did actually try to uh, modify the tennis ball idea a little further, and I came up with this. Now this is a loft hatch hook. It's just basically to, for opening a hatch in the roof to get into the loft, or attic, or whatever you might call it. So all I've done is basically tied some string around here. Obviously I've not done a particularly good job. Uh, it's very much a bodge job. Uh, you can tell I'm not mechanically minded. But, again, tennis ball, it's a bit more in keeping with what a medieval flail would be kind of like. So, let's just take a look. Can we do anything with this? Uh, well, it tends to, because of its construction, it's... Uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, unintentionally unravelling itself. Of... We well, probably really need to redo that, but yeah. I just do not feel safe, and of course we've got the extra length of this, which is probably a fair bit longer than a real a real shaft would be uh, for this sort of thing. But of course, if you did have this and the chain broke or the ball came off, you could still use a stick in some regards to uh, defend yourself. There's lots of things you can do with a stick. Of course, <laughs> yeah, that's bounced enough all over the place. <laughs> Well, let's just give that another try. I mean, this would have to be a two-handed weapon simply because of the length of the stick itself. I'm just adapting things so I've got my finger, sort of providing a bit more support around the uh, the rope. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let's just try shortening that again. And just see what we're getting. Yeah, it's a bit more controllable, but it's also banging onto my other one. But we're also getting a bit more control because of the shorter length of rope overall here. Now I think if I was to replace the tennis ball with this, we'd probably see a lot more impact, but would also end up getting a lot more pain on my home as this collided into it. Uh, because whatever's gonna happen here is almost certainly going to end up happening with this. 
Uh, which makes me think, if the medieval flail was indeed a genuine weapon of the period, not a later, uh, how shall we put this? Ooh, what's the best word to use to describe this? Embezzlement? Bewilderment? Fable? Lie? Embellishment! Just went through a whole load of words that don't really seem to have much connection to each other. Yes, if it is actually just a Victorian embezzlement, that something that they've made up to make the medieval period look a little bit sexier or more dangerous, a bit like the Iron Maiden, which as far as we can tell is not a genuine item from the period of the medieval e era. For those that don't know, an Iron Maiden is basically a human-shaped coffin, effectively, that stands upright and opens outwards and has a whole load of spikes on the inside and on the outside. Somebody would supposedly be stood inside it, the door would be closed, and they would either be impaled on it or they would have to stand perfectly still as a form of torture to avoid being touched by the spikes. Obviously, if you were a bigger person, then, you know, you would be in more danger of being spiked. But that would mean having to stand there for God knows how long, possibly until the fatigue kicked in and you end up slumping downwards or whatever, in which case you would end up getting spiked. But we've no evidence that it was a real medieval instrument. It's something that the Victorians seem to have made up. The same seems to be true regard the medieval flail. As far as a lot of historians seem to be concerned, they don't seem to be able to find any way to show that it was a genuine weapon, at least not of the period. There's some call about its practicality, like I've just shown with this very rough facsimile. <laughs> yes, you could try to use it, but you'd be in a lot of danger. Something I think Lindy Page showed, if I can find this video, I'll link to it. If you were going to battle information and you were using this, you'd be putting your own people in, tr in danger. I mean, obviously that's unraveled because of the poor job I've done of uh, putting it together. Ultimately, if you were standing next to somebody in line using something like this, would you want to? Possibly the formations brought down and this was a, your backup weapon. Yes, you might be able to use it, but then, then how do you carry it? If you try putting it into a belt, for example, then this is just basically going to be dangling around all over the place, hitting you. If you try putting it on your back, you've got the same sort of problem on your back. Okay, that would end up, as you're walking around, it would end up swinging around and hitting you. No matter how well you secure it, eventually it will come loose. And even if it is secured perfectly and never comes loose, you've still got the object of this thing bouncing into the back of you at some point sooner or later. Or just forming an uncomfortable spot on your back. The only way I could see anybody safely using this would be if they're actually in full armour. Preferably plate armour. Uh, even chainmail, for example, eventually the, the impacts are going to just end up going through the armour and impacting into your arm, you can have quite a bit of bruising. So I don't see it being particularly practical. The only time I could see anybody pot potentially using it would be, say, a knight on horseback. You know, they've lost the, their lance, they've lost their sword, this is the only backup they've got. They could potentially go charging through and just swinging down onto anybody below them because they could be holding it further up and then just allowing the impact to knock people off their feet or collide with somebody's head. I mean, if this was to hit somebody, it's going to do a significant amount of damage, whether it's just a rounded ball or a rounded ball with spikes on, or any other kind of design you care to think of, it's going to do a fair amount of damage on impact. Of course, if it does have spikes on it, uh, that could potentially lead to trouble getting it out, uh, which could actually do more damage when you think about it. If you've got this lodged in your skull and there's a spike in it, even if it hasn't killed you outright, you're probably going to be concussed all over the place like a Mortal Kombat character, and then somebody tears out, okay, because they're on, on route, you know, on their horse, driving past, driving past, riding past. It's lodged into your head for all of a split second. <laughs> More damage, which would actually make it somewhat ideal. But I've got my doubts as to whether or not this was actually really used in the medieval period full stop. Maybe in the Victorian period, maybe people went around pretending that this was uh, something people used. Or perhaps, like the flail, it might have been used as a weapon to try to uh, teach people how to control themselves more. Okay, it could have been used for hand and eye coordination. Perhaps not as well as the nunchucks, though. And let's face it, if you're do do doing sporing, you'd be very certainly be making use of your shield to protect against impacts from something like this. I don't have a shield, so I'm just using my arm to simulate that effect for the time being. But yeah, you would definitely learn to use your shield to protect you if somebody's going around swinging one of these things wildly at you. 
So I think that's basically it. Medieval flails, were they real? Can't say. Were they practical? No. Uh, could they do damage? Definitely. See you next time.